So the title of today's talk is When Facts Become Faith and hopefully through the talk you'll understand why I've given this sermon the title. So a certain man dies and he goes to um, the gates of heaven and he's confronted uh, with Peter and Peter says okay to get into heaven it's quite simple you have to score 1,000 points. You just give me a list of things that you do, that you've done, and I'll give you a certain amount of points for each thing you've done, and when it gets to 1,000, I'll let you in. He's like, oh, that's fine, that's fine. He was quite confident in what he's achieved in his life. So he starts off. I was um, a faithful husband, never looked at another woman. And Peter says, that's incredible. That's two points. Two points, says the man. Okay, right, okay, gets a little bit nervous. Okay, um, okay, I went to church every Sunday and I gave a, always gave a tenth of everything I've earned. That's fantastic, says Peter. That's one point. One point, says the man. Okay, okay, right, okay. Uh, digging deep here. Um, okay, this is it, this is the one. I created a food kitchen for homeless people. Lots of people came and, and was well fed. How about that? Peter, that's, that's amazing. Well done. Good on you. That's two points. Two points? And the man says, it's, well, in this rate, it's by God's grace alone that I'm going to be allowed into heaven. Peter says, bingo, a thousand points. Welcome. <laughs> we, like this man, like to have facts about ourselves and we're, we're very good at presenting them, these facts to other people to make ourselves look good. We let our left hand know what our, our right hand is doing. But like this man, do we put our faith in facts about ourselves? Or do we put our faith in what God has done? Do we put our faith in facts about ourselves or in what God has already done. The world cries out now. Everything in this universe is within you. Ask all from yourself. Faith in God is optional. But faith in yourself, in the spirit within you, it's imperative. This world is saying, I hold the truth, I hold the power. And we're going to see today that there was a blind beggar who knew that the, where the truth was and where the power was. And it wasn't within himself, it was passing by. So gonna, if you just um, read 30, verse 35 for me. As Jesus approached Jericho, a man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus of Nazareth passing by, that's a fact. He was a man called Jesus and he was from Nazareth. That's a fact. Saying, Jesus, son of David, that's turning that fact into faith. When people referred to Jesus as the son of David, they were saying that he was the Messiah, that he was the one that fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. He's a long awaited deliverer, the one that will redeem his people from their sin. We all need a Messiah because we all need mercy. Mercy that God will not punish us as our sins deserve. Deliverance from judgment. Who you think Jesus is, is the most important question anyone's ever going to have to think about. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? Is he just a man in a, from a particular place? <coughs> or is that man being appointed to achieve something that you cannot.
just a little back up the fact that, that, that Jesus is the son of David, we kind of find that out in, in Samuel 2, uh, um, where in, in verse 12, um, chapter 7, God says, I will establish, he's talking to King David here, I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will establish his throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he'll be my son. Jesus was the promised Messiah. And at the start of chapter 18, we've saw this a few weeks back, Jesus positions himself as the good judge. And he asks the question, when I come to earth, will I find faith? And when, we, when we're talking about the word faith today, always think of it as the word trust, because that's how the Bible translates that word in Greek. We kind of made the word faith kind of, uh, kind of a bit delusional and a bit out there. But the Christian faith is, is trust, 100% sure. Will he, will he find faith on earth? We go through this passage of chapter 18, we've done it the last couple of weeks, finding who's got faith, who's got real faith, who puts their whole trust in Jesus to save them. But we find out that people, this is my second point, have put faith in themselves. Faith in ourselves makes us unwilling and unable. Scripture uses the image of blindness to describe spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness could be, could be summarised as unwilling or unable to dis discern spiritual truths. And we see examples of that in, throughout the chapter, both in the Pharisee and in the young rich man. And there's a huge contrast to the faith found in the beggar and the Pharisee and the rich young man. <coughs> they come claiming that they can see, but we find out that they only see themselves. They don't see Jesus at all. They don't see who Jesus is. Basically, to summarise here, if you, when you have the wrong view of yourself, you have the wrong view of God. If you have the wrong view of God, you have the wrong view of yourself. For example, if you don't believe that God is a judge, well, you, you don't need anyone to defend you when you give your account to God. So we don't need, so it, it just carries on. So, we don't, so if we don't need anyone to defend ourselves, we don't need to give an account, we don't need a Messiah, we don't need mercy. We don't need what Jesus came for. So the Pharisee prays, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. He just gives a list of facts. Like, like the man in the joke, so he gives a list of facts of what he's done based on comparison, a comparison to other people. His spiritual blindness has made him unwilling to ask for mercy. And the tax collector who prayed alongside the Pharisee, he was the one, if you remember, who, who asked for mercy. Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. He had the right view of himself and he asked for mercy. He had the right response. Jesus says that that, that, that tax collector, he went home justified not the Pharisee. So the big point there is that the Pharisee was blinded, that he was unwilling to cry out. The rich young man, well, he was unable to follow. So uh, go to the, the, the Bible, um, page 1052. Good teacher, 
What must I do to inherit life, internal life? Oh, sorry, this is uh, verse 18. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these are kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. What an invitation. But when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Time and time again, Jesus challenges people not just to believe in him, but to follow. But we see the rich young man was unable to follow because he was blinded by what the world could give him, what he's achieved himself. They wanted salvation, but based on their terms. But Jesus is very clear how he was going to obtain mercy for them. From the rich to the poor, it's in the same way. It's by the same thing. And it's not found in what they do, it's found in what Jesus will do. Which leads us to the third point, the promised fact that Jesus would die. Verse 31 on your sheets. Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, we are going to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them and they did not know what he was talking about. The fact that Jesus died on the cross, it's an irrefutable fact of history. Historians, many historians would claim that it's crystal clear, it's completely true. That Jesus died the way in which the Gospels write how Jesus died. That he was on a cross. He said three times in, in Luke alone um, that how he would die. So this was an accident. He wanted to claim he was in control. This is how he was going to redeem his people from sin. And it wasn't by being a moral teacher. So in chapter 9.22 on your sheets, this is um, the first time in which um, Jesus predicts his death. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teacher of the law and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And interestingly, notice how, how he goes on. Verse 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross daily and follow me. So here again, Jesus is putting his, his death on the cross alongside, will you follow me? Just like we see in chapter 18. Why is that? Well, it's because he sets a pattern, a pattern for us to follow. Are we willing not just to believe, but follow and lay down our lives for the gospel? If you knew where, and if I knew where and when, and how I was going to die, I would run from that. But Jesus went straight to it. He went straight to it because he was willing and he was able to rise from the grave. You notice here the disciples didn't understand and that's a bit tricky to understand. Why didn't they understand? They were Jesus' closest followers, but they still didn't understand that they needed to be saved in the way that Jesus said he's going to save them. 
And we too, can, do we understand? Do we really understand that Jesus had to die in this way to save us? See, my fourth point is faith in Jesus makes you willing and able. We can learn a lot from this blind man. Initially, to cry out. Son of David, have mercy on me. He cried it out in front of the crowd. Couldn't see exactly where Jesus was. Son of David, have mercy on me. That's humiliating. There's utter dependence. They have utter dependence on God. Willing to follow. Verse 43, immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. Complete opposite to the rich young man. He went away sad. But the beggar followed Jesus and praised. Completely opposite. And he was able to receive salvation. Verse 42, receive your sight, your faith has healed you. Interestingly, like the story of the ten lepers, uh, the word healed is translated saved. <coughs> Receive your sight, your faith has saved you. Receive your sight, your faith has saved you. This was the last miracle, healing miracle of Jesus' ministry. And what a way to end it. How can we apply this passage to our lives? Well, for those not trusting in Jesus, that he'll be the one that will redeem them from their sin, be willing to understand. Be willing to understand and let go of the facts that you hold so dearly to, about yourself. Just be willing to understand. Give it a go. And for those who are trusting in Jesus, for mercy, that he is, he is the promised Messiah, <coughs> quite simply, follow him. Trust him. Trust him more than you trust yourself. It's very easy to say, oh, trust in, trust in Jesus. But work on it. Work on trusting in him. Work on just letting go, step by step, the things that you think that you, think you can sort out for yourself. <coughs> Keep putting yourself in that position as the receiver, not the giver. Follow him. Lay your life down and praise him. We're following Jesus with praise, like Jim was saying. We should be praising God more than we praise our football team for what he has done. I was going to end on what we just sang earlier, which just summarises <coughs> that little bit of rambling I just done. <laughs> there is no other name in heaven can be found through whom we are redeemed for whom your grace abounds. No other name can save but Jesus Christ, our Lord. <laughs>